So we're on. Yeah. We we'll just wait a few minutes before um, so that we get uh, a number of. Yeah, so we got over a hundred and then we can start, I think. Okay, so welcome everyone and particularly welcome to Dr. Kelsey Norman from Rice uh, University, who is um, going to be our uh, you know, speaker today. Uh, this is the SOAS Middle East Institute weekly seminars on Tuesday between or lectures. Uh, between 5.30 and uh, 7 p.m. Um, so it's organized by the SOAS Middle East Institute and by myself as the chair of the Center for Palestine Study and my colleague, Nagis Berzat, who is the chair of the Center for Iranian Studies. So we are uh, we are partners in crime. Here, I think. <laughs> so we're looking forward to hearing your, um, your, your discussion around a very topical issue. Um, and, um, you know, sort of based on your research, um, and obviously it's based on uh, your book, which came out uh, in 2020 by Cambridge University Press, uh, and it's called Reluctant Reception, Refugees, Migration and Governance in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, Dr. Kelsey Norman, Norman is a fellow for the Middle East at uh, Rice University, and she is the director of the Women's Rights, Human Rights and Refugee Programme. And uh, she, she has published widely, and she has also written for uh, media publication like the Washington Post and the Atlantic. And she is advisory board of Refugees uh, Solidarity Network in New York. So you have a lot of experience and a lot to say. Um, Dr. Norman will speak for about 45 minutes. And for uh, all of you, if you could put your questions uh, in the icon that says questions and answers, and we will try and uh, collate the questions and uh, pose them uh, to Kelsey as we go along. Uh, so welcome, without further ado, we look forward to hearing you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina. Thank you to the Middle East Center at SOAS for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to, to be able to speak today. Uh, or tonight, I guess, for your, for your time. Um, let me just go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Um, so hopefully everybody can hear me well. Uh, so today I'm presenting my book, as, as Dina uh, said in the introduction. This, this is a relatively recent publication. It just came out in November of 2020. So I'm excited to have these opportunities to share it uh, virtually with you. And I look forward to questions. Um, so a major premise of the book is that when we think about refugees, when we think about migration, um, when we think about migratory voyages, we often think about images like this. So this was one of the many iconic images that came out of that period in 2015 at the height of Europe's uh, so-called refugee crisis. Um, so we think about you know, boats crossing uh, uh, waters. We think about people trying to cross land borders. And often when we think about these images and what we usually see are, are uh, migratory journeys that are, are depicted from the global south to the global north, whether in this case it's crossing, um, crossing from Turkey to the Greek islands or in the North American context, maybe individuals trying to cross the desert between Mexico and the United States southern border. Um, the reality though, if we think about like this, this particular time period in 2015 was that it was really the minority of individuals who were actually ending up in Europe or who successfully ended up in Europe. Um, so as you can see from this infographic, the, the green dots represent the asylum applications that were filed by Syrian individuals in particular uh, between January 2015 and June 2016. And they really pale in comparison to these red dots, which are individual uh, Syrian individuals residing in countries that neighbor Syria, so countries like Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, or Egypt. Um, and perhaps this isn't surprising to those in, in the audience today, but you know, even, even those who might be more aware of the fact that there is this large Syrian refugee population residing in countries of the Middle East, it's sometimes easy to forget that when we're constantly bombarded by stories, you know, journalistic accounts or photographs. Of, of refugees and asylum seekers and migrants attempting voyages towards the global north. But if we think beyond 2015, if we think beyond that particular moment 
uh, of, of people heading towards Europe, um, this is a broader phenomenon. So the number of international migrants um, is depicted on, as, a, as a stock on the, the, um, in the graph on the left. And you can see that whilst the majority of, of migrants do end up living in countries of the global north, it's nearly half of, of migrants that end up in countries of the global south. So this is generally speaking south to south migration. And that's nearly half of the world's migratory uh, patterns. And then this is of course even more pronounced for, for the number of refugees in the world. So on the right, this is um, a stock uh, of the number of refugees living in either countries of the global south or global north. And you can see it's the vast majority, nearly 90% that live in countries of the global south. But you wouldn't necessarily know that from, again, the way that that's migratory stories and um, uh, news articles depict depict migration or depict refugees, but also you know, policy documents or even academic literature. There's a, a sort of discrepancy between the number of books and articles written about um, migrants residing in countries of the global north versus those that live in the global south. Um, so my book is, I think, part of this corrective, um, and there's many other important um, research projects coming out as well, trying to understand, well, why, what happens in the global south? How do countries in the global south receive migrants and refugees? How do migrants and refugees manage um, in these countries. So specifically then in my book, I'm looking at one particular region, um, how do Middle, Middle East and North African host states manage their migrant and refugee populations. And I break this larger question down into this sort of three sub questions. So how do states respond to new patterns of settlement? What causes a response to change over time? And then what are the consequences of a given policy or a chosen policy for migrants and refugees themselves? Um, so today I'll talk about the basic argument or some, some of the arguments of this book. Um, I'll talk about some of the methods I used um, in, in this project. I'll present some of the case study evidence from the countries uh, in which I was doing this research. And I'll talk briefly about some of the, the larger picture issues and some of the policy implications um, from this book. So in the book, I talk about what are some of the reasons why we as an academic field um, might know less about how countries in the global south uh, receive migrants and refugees. So what are some of the assumptions that have been implicit in this literature? One factor is this assumption about impermanence. So whether we're talking about migrants, um, if, if we're talking about migrants, we tend to think of people passing through countries um, like those that I look at in, in this book, um, specifically Egypt, Morocco, and Turkey. So these, these states that get labeled as transit countries. Um, there are, people are assumed to be just passing through them en route to other countries of the global north. And the reality is that not everyone is able to realistically complete their journey. So a lot of people sort of end up getting stuck for periods of time in these countries that are thought to be countries of transit, but in reality, as I talk about in the book, are also host states, you know, in their own right. And then with refugees, it's often assumed that um, individuals will, might have to leave their home country because of uh, civil war or violence or persecution, you know, for a variety of reasons, and that they might end up in a neighboring country. But once that situation in their home country resolves, they'll go back home. But the reality is um, that we see increasingly protracted refugee situations and that not everybody is ever comfortable um, returning to their home state, or at least not for long periods of time. Um, the second assumption that I discuss is that there's been much more of a focus, at least previously, there's been more of a focus on camps as, as sites of refugee um, inhabitants, uh, as opposed to urban spaces, even though the reality is that now the, the majority of refugees worldwide live in urban locations, or at least not in camps, sometimes rural locations as well. So in a camp situation, um, the question of how a host state responds might not be as relevant because maybe in camps they aren't able to interact with uh, host country nationals or host country authorities, but that's not, the that's not the case for urban locations where they're definitely going to be interacting with um, host country nationals and potentially also with host country authorities. So the question of how a host state responds is, is much more relevant. And then the third assumption is um, Particularly, I'm drawing this really from the political science literature on, on migration. And it's this assumption that host states just don't maybe have, host states in the global south just don't have the ability or the capacity to engage with migrants or refugees. So we really shouldn't expect much from them. Um, and they sort of are dismissed as these, you know, less important actors in this global scheme of um, migrant refugee protection. But what I argue in the book, and this is 
really sort of the main thrust of, of the book um, is that maybe it's not a, necessarily an a, a issue of capacity so much as the state choosing not to directly inter interact with migrants and refugees, at least initially, and instead looking at sort of other options. So that leads me to one of the main arguments, which is this idea of indifference. So I argue that um, there is this possibility that states are, even though it might look like they're not doing much, like, it, like there might just be sort of a neglectful approach to migrants and refugees, that actually if we think about this as a, as a policy and as a strategic choice that the state is making, that um, a state can utilize this type of policy, this indifference, um, to interact in indirectly with migrants and refugees. And this indirect engagement is mediated by international uh, non-governmental organizations, as well as local, domestic, uh, civil society actors who basically step in and do things on behalf of the state, provide services, um, make sure that migrants and refugees are able to somehow get by um, without much direct involvement from the state itself. And I argue that if a state chooses this type of policy, um, it, it yields these tangential benefits for the host state. So first of all, they're getting this, um, they're getting sort of uh, 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 tangential, again, <laughs> uh, economic benefits um, from these international actors that are bringing in effectively development aid that gets distributed not just to refugees or asylum seekers, but also to host state nationals. And I can talk more about sort of uh, specific examples that I, I draw on in the book for that. Um, so if we consider this uh, policy of indifference as a policy, then we can understand how things like diplomatic or economic concerns are actually driving the, the decision of the state to enact a different type of policy, at least as much as, as its capacity. So it kind of um, reformulates the idea of capacity and sees the hands-off approach that a state might use as actually strategic, as opposed to just not having the ability to do anything. And then if it chooses, if a state chooses this indifference policy, then it allows for, or it sort of necessitates, this de facto economic and social integration for migrants and refugees themselves. So even though they might not be allowed to formally participate in the economy, for example, they're more or less allowed to, or permitted by the state to participate um, in the informal economy. And they're often allowed to do things like form social organizations, sometimes even political organizations. And I'll talk more about that um, going forward. So let me just give you a sense of where this idea about indifference fits within the existing options that states might have according to the academic, academic literature. So when I talk about engagement, um, a host state, host state engagement, what I'm saying is that there's that we're accounting for any interaction, whether it's direct or indirect, that a state has with migrants and refugees residing on its territory. And when we talk about engagement, more commonly in sort of the existing literature drawn from the global north, we're thinking about a liberal engagement policy. So this is the idea that states are actively bringing migrants or refugees into a national system through things like education or training opportunities or providing uh, housing, these types of activities that we might think about as integration. Um, alternatively, and again, this is borrowing from the existing literature, a state might act with a repressive policy. So this aims to really remove migrants or refugees from the host state, whether it's through um, policing or detention or even deportation um, in, some, in some cases. But what I'm offering is that there's this third option that's again characterized by indirect engagement. So um, international organizations and civil society actors are stepping in to provide these types of services for the state. And it's um, also characterized by this de facto integration, economic and social integration for migrants and refugees. So if we think about these three policies um, on, this, on this graph, um, we have uh, on the X axis, the goal of the policy, whether it's more excluding or more including migrants and refugees into a national system. And then we think about the relative resource um, expenditure. So what's, what's required for the state to actually implement the policy on a scale of just low to high. Um, you can see that both a repressive and a liberal policy are relatively costly for the state. So they require a lot of state resources, whether it's, again, you know, training programs, educational, you know, bringing uh, migrants and refugees into national education systems, et cetera, in the case of a liberal policy or uh, policing and detaining and, and uh, deporting migrants uh, in terms of a repressive policy. But indifference is relatively cost effective. It doesn't require much of the state, but it looks good internationally. So states are still getting sort of that, um, that uh, reputational benefit 
by implementing a policy of indifference because they're not actively you know, deporting or removing migrants and refugees from, from their states, but they're also not having to expend a ton of energy or a ton of resources to implement a liberal policy. So that's what I argue is you know, the benefit for the state in terms of a policy of indifference. So how do these different policies that I'm, I'm discussing, how do they map onto empirical reality? Um, so the cases that I talk about in this book, which are Morocco, Egypt, and Turkey, you can see from this map, they fall along these important migratory routes leading up towards Europe. But of course, um, in reality, many people are not able to complete those journeys. Um, so as I talked about in the book, in the, you know, beginning in the 1990s or even earlier really, but amplified in the 1990s and, and first decade of the 2000s, it became increasingly difficult for people to actually get to Europe because of these border externalization policies that the EU had been implementing. Um, so we see these longer term stays of people arriving in Morocco or Egypt or Turkey who are not able to travel onward. Um, and so they, they meet this requirement that, or this term that I, I talk about in the book, which is a transit turned host country. So they are countries of transit for some people, but they're also host countries for others who cannot complete those journeys. Um, and I can talk more about the case section or about particular cases um, in the Q&A if, if you want to know more about that. Um, so between 2012 and 2015, basically, uh, I carried out field work in, in each of these three countries, um, ultimately completing uh, just over 130 interviews with, um, with both elite actors. So these are individuals in government positions, uh, people working at the UNHCR or the IOM, as well as uh, international NGOs and local NGOs um, in, in each of these three countries, and then as well as individual migrants and refugees, um, attempting to sort of include as much diversity as possible within, within that sample, although acknowledging it's not a statistically significant sample of uh, migrants and refugees residing in these three states, I tried to speak with sort of as many nationalities of people as possible, um, different genders, people coming from or who had spent various amounts of time in the host states and people who were affiliated with organizations like NGOs or community-based organizations, um, but also those who are not. So what I present in the book, and this is, this is laid out in, in three different chapters looking at each country and its sort of migratory history as well as what's happened more recently, um, are these trajectories. So I talk about how in each of the three, three countries, Egypt, Morocco, and Turkey, for that, that last decade of the the last century of the 1990s, as well as the first decade of the 2000s, each country was more or less using this policy of indifference. And I talk about how it looks a bit different in each country, but there are these commonalities. And then, in, interestingly, in the first decade of this, uh, sorry, the second decade of the 2000s, um, we see these different changes. So Egypt moves um, towards a more repressive policy, and Morocco and Turkey move towards, they have these big migratory overhauls of their, of their policy frameworks. And at least at a de jure level, they, they move towards more liberal policies. And so um, this is you know, kind of the empirical heart of the book. So I don't wanna, it's hard to do it justice at this point because there's kind of a lot of details involved. But I talk about how in Egypt, this is very much related to the securitization of migration that happens um, in 2013. So domestically, probably as many of you remember, that was the year when we saw this military coup that removed former President Mohamed Morsi from power and beginning really with Syrian refugees um, and then spreading to other nationalities as well. We see this linkage um, between the issue of migration and refugees uh, and other what, what the state perceived as other threats. So migration became linked with things like terrorism or porous borders or um, you know, the possibility that migrants and refugees could be, um, you know, that could be affiliated with the, the former uh, president and his uh, political party. So um, at this point, Egypt starts investing more and more resources in heavier policing, uh, detaining uh, migrants in a, in a way that hadn't been doing before, and then even deporting, especially Syrians, um, to, uh, to other countries sometimes, uh, if not back to Syria, then to, to Palestine, for example, to Gaza. Um, so we see this move from Egypt, its willingness to invest uh, more resources in this policy, this more repressive policy, because it deemed migration and the presence of refugees to be a threat at that time. In the case of Morocco and Turkey, we see a very different shift around the same time period. So in Morocco, uh, there had been pressure on the state for, for years prior to 2013, 
uh, from civil society, Moroccan civil society actors, as well as um, community-based migrant organizations kind of teaming together to put pressure on the state. But it wasn't until 2013 when sort of two factors uh, were very important that, that occurred. So those civil society actors went to the international sphere to Geneva and shamed the Moroccan government about its human rights practices towards migrants. And also um, there was increasing pressure from Europe that the Moroccan government um, saw as important uh, about its, about its uh, policing, its migrant situation, and also potentially um, changing how it dealt with migration domestically, as well as the Moroccan government looking increasingly toward its southern neighbors in West Africa and perceiving those states as you know, geostrategically important, like for diplomatic purposes, but also economic um, ties, um, which is where a lot of the migrants coming to Morocco were originating from. So this uh, confluence of factors then, this international shaming along with this, these diplomatic incentives um, lead Morocco to adopt this brand new framework in 2013 that kind of rolls out in 2014 and 2015, um, in which it promises to have this new politics of migration um, and to treat migrants and refugees um, residing in Morocco with a sort of more um, human rights friendly approach. This doesn't entirely play out in practice as they talk about in the book, but it does make this very public, um, very you know, sort of diplomatically salient um, uh, movement towards a more liberal, liberal framework. In Turkey, this plays out very differently, but also um, a, a major change comes to fruition in 2013 and 2014. So, Beginning really in 2008, there's a shift in Turkey amongst some of the political leaders who see Turkey as being very geostrategically important in regards to its um, relationship with Europe at that time. And also a number of human rights cases that were brought against Turkey at the European Court of Human Rights um, by European actors, but also domestic civil society actors in Turkey um, because of Turkey's treatment of asylum seekers in Turkish detention centers. So this is at a point when Turkey still cared a lot about its you know, diplomatic image in regards to the European Union. Um, so we see a major change happen, um, this, this uh, desire to draft this new policy, this new framework for, for migration and asylum that ultimately comes to fruition in 2013 and then is um, uh, adopted in 2014. So again, we see this confluence of international shaming as a tactic, as well as the state caring about um, or seeing migration as being very important to its diplomatic um, uh, goals. So um, we see these movements. Uh, people have asked me before, well, what, what happened? You know, why, why are all these things occurring in 2013, 2014? And I think that there are different reasons, um, you know, whether it's domestic politics or some changes at the international level. But with these three cases that I'm looking at, there is this really interesting movement that happens um, in, in this period of a couple of years. Um, so I talk in the book a bit about different alternative ex explanations that someone might pose. Um, so going back to this policy of indifference that these states are using initially to respond to migrants and refugees. Um, some might say, well, maybe it's just a matter of uh, the state not really having the ability to do much. So maybe indifference is really kind of just the state, you know, the state neglecting this issue or not seeing this issue as important. Um, and I think there's, you know, I think that the, the state capacity is not, it's, <laughs> it is an issue, but I don't think it's the only explanation of how a state responds. So one thing I talk about in the book um, to sort of push back against that alternative explanation is the fact that we see this movement that I just talked about in the previous slide um, towards a repressive policy in Egypt's case, but also towards a liberal policy in Morocco and Turkey's case. Um, and you know, the fact that the state suddenly decides to implement a liberal policy is not because their state capacity suddenly changed uh, during these two years, uh, 2013, 2014, it's because you know, the state perceived different incentives from implementing a more liberal policy or a more oppressive policy. But another anecdote I'd like to share from, um, from the Egyptian case uh, is the following. So this is in the context of the Rabat massacre that occurred in, in August, 2013, um, whereby the, the supporters of former President Mohamed Morsi were sort of camped out um, in, in a particular part of Cairo and um, were demanding that, you know, Morsi be reinstated because they didn't see his removal as legitimate. Um, unfortunately, as, as probably all of you remember or aware, you know, that, that ultimately um, led to the deaths of several hundred, I think over 800 uh, Egyptian protesters at the hands of Egyptian authorities. 
Um, so it was it was a massacre effectively, and it was very violent. Um, so the the context in regards uh, that, that relates to my research is that I was speaking with um, a refugee school director who there's many refugee schools in Cairo, and this is this is one that happens to be uh, located in sort of more central Cairo. And the director was telling me re recounting this incident on the morning of the Rabat massacre. So before any violence had taken place, he got a phone call from a woman at the Ministry of the Interior. Um, he had not spoken with anyone from the Ministry of the Interior at any point prior to this. His school was unregistered with the Egyptian government, which it is, not, is not how it, it is supposed to be. It's supposed to be registered, but he had been operating without any problems um, despite it being unregistered. So he gets a phone call and he says, and the woman on the other line, um, the ministry representative told him, you know, I think it would be best if you did not open your school today because there is possibly going to be violence and we think it would be better if you told the children to just stay home. And that was it. There was no other, you know, there was not accusing him of anything or uh, being or objecting to his lack of registration. It was just, you know, sort of a, a letting him know and advising him not to open. So he says here, quote, I laughed because I'd actually been overseas and I had just changed my phone number only three days earlier, but they managed to get straight to me on my mobile. So I think this is uh, indicative of just how closely the Egyptian state is monitoring this migrant refugee protection system, even if they are not directly interfering with them um, and are generally sort of, you know, taking a more hands-off approach to administering this system, you know, they do, they know all the contacts, they know where these schools are operating, they know where other types of services are operating, and they are closely observing and following exactly what is going on. And if an organization were to sort of cross a red line or, you know, overstep their boundaries uh, in terms of what they're doing, providing services to migrants and refugees, the Egyptian state would undoubtedly intervene in that situation. So I think this is helpful in, in rethinking some of our conceptions about you know, capacity as being a major inhibitor and, and not always assuming that a lack of action on behalf of the state indicates a lack of capacity. And this is in line with other literature that's coming out, um, both in you know, political science, but in other fields, looking at things like protests or um, in the case of uh, Alicia Holland, she has a book on uh, the state sort of not interfering with irregular um, street vending in Latin America. So again, states might might hesitate from reacting or might choose not to react, not as an indication of state weakness, but because they're actually strategic about when and how they interact or um, refrain from, from interacting with, um, in this case, migrants and refugees and the organizations working with them. Okay, I'll shift gears a bit now and talk about the consequences of these different types of policies for individuals. Um, so even though I've talked a lot about state policy and you know the state as a as a structure up until now, um, uh, the really sort of the heart of the book is formed by um, these interviews I did with with migrants and refugees themselves and how these different policies in place actually impact and structure the lives of those living within the state. So. Um, as I said before, part of what allows a policy of indifference to work is this um, hands-off approach from the state in regards to what individuals can and cannot do in, in the country, in, in the countries in which they're living. So, you know, if you go to, um, for example, on the left, there's a photo from um, a neighborhood called Takadum in Rabat that's known, you know, to everyone, to, to me as a researcher, but I found out because everyone's kind of aware that there's a large migrant refugee population or asylum seeker population living in this neighborhood amongst other Moroccan nationals, but it is sort of a place where people who are first arriving in Morocco can go to get themselves set up. And it's a place where you can find informal work to go and participate in the Moroccan economy. Um, similarly, Aksaraya neighborhood in Istanbul looks and feels similar. So there's a, a large migrant refugee population residing there. Um, and as you can see from this photo on the right, there's, you know, all sorts of goods out on display and people can um, and have the ability to participate in this informal economy that allows them to get by in the absence of a really strong state policy, um, or you know, sometimes there's some help from migrant refugee uh, organizations, NGOs, but oftentimes people are sort of left to fend for themselves. And so the ability that the hands-off approach of the state, this policy and indifference, allows them to get by. Um, and I open each of the, the empirical chapters with you know, a story or a vignette from um, someone who shared their narrative with me 
um, about how they manage in these host states. And I think one of the things I talk about in the conclusion is that I'm really trying to push back against this idea that I think can also be implicit in this um, academic literature on global South migration that sees migrants and refugees as maybe sometimes lacking a bit of agency. Um, and I think oftentimes it's written, it's written about with, you know, the, uh, from the, the viewpoint of, uh, well, you know, people, there aren't strong policies in place in global South states to protect or to um, enable migrants and refugees to participate much, maybe not in the same way as in global North countries. Um, so people are sort of just left to waste away or, you know, waste their lives. And I think oftentimes maybe that's because, um, as I said earlier, a lot of this literature looks at camp situations where it is more difficult for people to participate in a host state community. But that's not the case for urban populations, which again is, is what I'm looking at in this book. Um, so people are very much, you know, sending their children to schools, whether it's refugee schools or in some, some cases, um, national schools of the country uh, for certain nationalities or, or populations. Um, they're finding ways to, to work informally, whether it's in things like restaurants or in domestic work or um, selling goods along the street, um, what have you. And in some cases, they're, you know, they're forming community organizations, social organizations, and also sometimes even political organizations. I think especially in the case of Morocco, I talk quite a bit about how those political organizations were very vibrant and were really pushing, putting pressure on the state um, on this issue of, of migrant and refugee rights. So, um, you know, I, as I said, I open each, each chapter with a story and I'll just share this story from the picture on the far right, which is, um, I, I call this, I, I give everyone a moniker in, in the book who I was able to speak with, but um, we'll call the man on the left, Amadou, um, who's originally from Senegal. And he comes to Morocco, he comes to Rabat and is looking for work, um, ultimately wants to work as a mechanic because that's his background and his training, but he has to find whatever he can and ultimately starts uh, selling SIM cards along this major thoroughfare in Rabat. Um, and as I'm talking to him one day, um, this police officer, the man on the right, comes up and sort of pretends like he's gonna grab Madhu's phone, uh, which is really tense for a moment, but then they both burst out laughing and they clearly have this established rapport and they joke around for a while. Um, so as we're sitting there, um, you know, I'm kind of, I'm shocked by this because I, you know, I, I would be worried um, if I were doing something in an activity like a uh, regular street vending and a police officer came up, but they have, you know, he knows this particular person, he knows what he can and cannot do in front of him. So this, this man walks away, the officer walks away, but after a few minutes, another group of police officers from a different faction um, come up sort of ambling up the street and you can quickly see all the vendors packing up their goods and making to leave and depart. Um, and Amadou as well packs up his goods and, and makes his way. So, you know, he's learned that with this particular guy, he can laugh and joke around. But then as soon as another set of police officers come up, he needs to leave as, as does everybody else on the street. So these informal rules are really important in the context where formal policy might dictate one thing, but what you actually can and cannot do um, is a very much a different question. And it's something that has to sort of be learned as you acclimate to life in, in this kind of host state. Um, so, oops. I'll talk then briefly about some of the policy implications from this work. Um, as I said earlier, when I was looking at the, the map outlining my case selection, um, what part of ne what necessitates this study is this EU externalization that's been occurring for decades now that really at all costs aims to prevent onward migration of migrants and refugees towards Europe. So part of that has been establishing these agreements with countries that, you know, are considered transit countries. I'm calling them transit turned host countries in this book. Um, but we see, especially after 2015, we see this amplification of this process of externalization and these, of these partnership agreements. Um, and I think that we'll continue to see that going forward as, you know, as evidenced by um, meetings even just earlier or at the end of last year, which, you know, called for instead of trying to sort of, you know, reconcile internal issues within the EU of resettlement and, um, you know, responsibility sharing, um, we see a call for continued responsibility shifting outside um, beyond the EU's borders. 
So I think that if we continue to see that, which seems like we will, that we'll also continue to see this indifference and informality at play for migrants and refugees residing in these neighboring countries, um, like those that I look at in this book. I do think we, we maybe will see these de jure liberal policies, like like I discussed in Turkey and in Morocco, if there are these economic and diplomatic gains to be had from shifting towards a more you know, outwardly liberal policy. Um, but the reality is that that doesn't always play out on the ground for migrants and refugees themselves, um, as we see in, in Turkey and Morocco in my case, uh, in the cases discussed in this book. We also might see a repressive policy if migrants and refugees are suddenly deemed a security threat. And I think that a real danger to this pathway towards um, a liberal policy, so this pathway towards reforming policies that we saw in Morocco and Turkey, is that we can see a shift, a really sudden shift towards a more repressive policy because the state is not necessarily committed to you know, a truly more liberal policy for migrants and refugees themselves. And if it sees sort of different incentives from implementing a more repressive policy, as we saw with Turkey in 2019, for example, um, we might see a really sudden shift towards that. So I think that's that's the danger towards um, of, of um, sort of, of the, you know, it's trying to incentivize um, more liberal policies from, from these countries as the EU has been pushing for and also actors like the UNHCR and the IOM. So a major takeaway then from this book is that we need to stop seeing global South actors as just sort of the recipients of the policy choices of more powerful states like those in the EU or, you know, in the North American context, those of like the, like the US um, or international actors like the UNHCR or the IOM because they are strategic actors, even though it might appear not appear otherwise sometimes, and they have their own vested interests. So we should be, we should attempt to understand what those interests are. Um, so before I, I close, I'll just talk about the chapters in the book so you get a sense of how it's laid out if you're interested. Um, so in, in the second chapter, I talk more again about this theory of indifference as well as um, some of the alternative explanations and how this fits in within this broader literature, um, both within the political science literature, but sort of the broader migratory and, and refugee literature. Um, I, the chapters three, four, and five are the sort of empirical heart of the book, looking at each country in turn and this trajectory that I talked about. Um, in chapter six, I, I look more at a micro level at specifically Morocco and, Tur uh, sorry, Morocco and Egypt. And I try to understand whether different groups of uh, nationalities residing in these two host states, whether they receive differential treatment from the state itself and how they perceive that, that differential treatment if it exists. And whether it's based on things like um, race or um, you know, perceptions of race or ethnicity. Um, and this also ties into this uh, thesis in the political science literature about host states having certain identities um, and whether that then translates into you know, policy and then affects individuals. Um, so I can talk more about that in the Q&A if, if you're curious about that chapter. Chapter seven looks specifically at the role of international actors, really most prominently the UNHCR and the IOM and whether those organizations and also their you know, main funders, which are Global North states, um, how impactful they are in determining host state policy outcomes. Chapters eight and also partly the conclusion look quite a bit at um, this change that happened in 2015. So as I said before, a lot of the field work for this book was carried out between 2012 and 2015. So I wanted to look at everything that's happened since 2015, how these arguments um, for different types of policies fit into this, this paradigm within the Mediterranean um, what Europe has done since then and how it's impacted countries in the region and then what, of course, the implications are for migrants and refugees themselves. Um, and then lastly, in the conclusion, I, I talk a bit about, talk a bit, a bit about the methodology of the book, but also about how maybe this argument for indifference and different types of, of host state responses might travel to other regions. So whether we're talking about, you know, Central America and Mexico and the, the impact that US policies have had for those countries, or, you know, it, potentially in the Pacific region with, um, with uh, Australia's actions and the impact for countries like Indonesia, for example. Um, so I will go ahead and just stop there and um, we can open up for, for questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Kelsey. That was uh, very interesting and informative as well as uh, sweeping in terms of range. You've covered a lot. 
Uh, before I go on to the questions, I have a small question myself, which is, uh, did you do any research of how the, uh, the, the host populations, rather than the states, um, react to refugees in response to changes in policies? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if, you, if you have done any work on that, that might be interesting to answer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, uh, I guess the short answer is no. <laughs> I wish I had, you know, had more time. I would, I would probably either try to look at. I know other people have done some interesting, like, survey work to try to get this, get a sense of national um, sentiments towards um, the presence of migrants and refugees. I did not personally conduct any uh, interviews with host state nationals, so I didn't include that. But I, I did include, you know. Um, newspapers, uh, sort of um, uh, journalistic analyses of how host populations are, are feeling or, you know, national sentiments. But I think, and I, and I do draw on other people's work um, to talk, especially in, at least in Turkey and Morocco, I know of um, research projects that have looked at like national surveys of, of host state nationals and their, their perceptions towards migrants and refugees. So I include like secondary work, I guess you could say. Um, and I think, you know, especially in Turkey, it was very apparent that the national um, population, uh, sort of national sentiments towards the presence of Syrians was changing quite rapidly when I was doing field work. Um, and in Morocco as well, there were certain heightened points at which um, the issue became quite politicized, especially racialized. And in Egypt too, it's just that, you know, at least with Egypt, there's, there's always concerns about uh, how free the press is and how much, you know, state television is, uh, is being influenced by, um, by governmental perspectives. So I think, you know, that I, I don't know of um, like a national uh, census or, or a national survey looking at Egyptian populations um, uh, attitudes towards migrant and refugees, but that would be interesting too. Yes, and I think media can tell us a lot about attitudes because they, they tend to reflect them. But I want to go into some very interesting questions. The first one is, could you comment on whether there was dif differential treatment based on gender? And Claire is also asking another question, which is, so the same person, how has COVID impacted refugee policies uh, in global South countries, whether you have looked into that at all? Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of gender, uh, well, so in, in the chapter uh, that I briefly mentioned in, in the table of contents, um, gender is one of the, so what I, what I do in this chapter is um, I look at all the migrant refugee interviews I was able to do in Egypt and Morocco specifically. And then I'm looking at um, different um, characteristics of my, my interviewees. So gender is one of them, as well as nationality, as well as um, how long someone has spent in the host state, and then um, whether or not they have legal status. And I mean, it's interesting because, you know, speaking individually, so looking not um, collectively, but speaking with individuals, people have all sorts of feelings about how, you know, their race or their gender might be impacting how they are perceived. And, and that is, uh, I mean, I, I, I discuss some of those and I think absolutely, you know, it impacts um, the opportunities someone might have, how safe they might feel, what they feel they can and cannot do in the host state. So I provide examples of that. But when I do look at the aggregate, it is interesting that the, the two most sort of influential factors are actually how long someone spent in the host state, as well as um, whether or not they have legal status. So that that's, you know, if I'm looking at whether they've had interactions with the police, um, what they think, if do they think that they are, do they receive preferential treatment? Are they able to access certain services or go to a hospital, all these types of things. Those are the two end up being the two most important factors for how, kind of how comfortable or how maybe integrated someone feels in the host state. So I think that there is something to be said about like, regardless of your nationality or maybe your gender, uh, there's a learning curve. So I, I look at, you know, whether someone has spent less than two years versus more than two years in the host state, as well as whether they're able to achieve some kind of legal status, whether it's whether you're a migrant or an asylum seeker or a refugee. And I think that that allows them to then know the system a bit more, to know the community, to know what organizations are out there um, that can help them, as well as, you know, establish um, relationships with, you know, um, co-nationals or potentially with host state, uh, the host state population. Um, and that helps them a lot to, to be able to feel a lot more comfortable in the host state. Um, but, but again, that, that chapter goes into all of those factors a bit more um, specifically. In terms of COVID, I mean, unfortunately, like this book doesn't discuss it at all, just given production line processes. 
uh, and timelines. Um, but I, you know, I have been following at least, well, I guess really in the three countries, um, how this has been impacting people. And I mean, it's, as you can imagine, it's just making everything that much more difficult. Um, people don't necessarily have great access to health centers anyway. Some people, if you have legal status in, in certain countries, you're able to at least access national hospitals or national clinics. But whether that actually happens in, you know, in, in a de facto sense is questionable, depends on like who, who, who you are, who, um, who you happen to go, which, hosp which hospital you happen to go to, how you're treated there. Um, so I think people are quite afraid even more than they would be normally to, to access, to try and access national um, health systems. I think that I was just speaking with someone yesterday in, in the Egyptian context who, um, who says that, you know, asylum seekers and, and refugees and, and migrants are, are all terrified of contracting COVID because they know that they probably won't receive great treatment. Even They won't be a priority for like a respirator or anything else if they were to have to go to a hospital. So I think people People are just really cautious and quite scared, um, you know, adding to additional fears that, that anyone might feel on a normal basis about trying to exist um, in, in uh, Egyptian society. Um, and I think that whether and how these populations will end up getting vaccines once they arrive, I think, you know, unfortunately, they might also be at sort of the bottom of lists. So they're probably not super hopeful about what, when the situation will improve. Um, so I, I won't say anything more about that because I'm, I unfortunately am not on the ground and I don't know enough about how, um, how it's playing out in terms of um, what people can and cannot do at the moment. But yeah, I think it's definitely, um, uh, you know, elevated any existing um, difficulties or fears that people might have. So your, your comment about the status actually kind of seeps well into a question, which is whether uh, what is what are the long-term opportunities for asylum seekers and migrants? Uh, can they re receive residency or citizenship? And then have there been attempts at creating semi-autonomous entities for uh, the migrant and refugee communities that you, you studied? Mm -hmm. So somehow they relate to the question of the status, citizenship, etc. Okay, sure. I mean, it's, um, uh, I don't know which, which country to start with because there's interesting developments, I think, in all three of them in regards to that. But so, for example, in Morocco, when I talked about this, this big um, policy change in 2013 uh, that occurred, uh, um, the sort of, you know, the, the headline part of that was that the state was offering this regularization campaign for irregular migrants uh, that were residing in Morocco. And not all of them were from Sub-Saharan Africa, many were from other regions, but the sort of the part of the impetus was to regularize people that were coming from various, especially West African countries. Um, so many people, um, uh, I think in the end, more than 20,000 individuals did receive regularization. But the, the reality was that uh, even though you might get a, a residency permit, which means that you have, you go from having been a regular to having a, a legal status by which you could apply for formal work or you know, formal housing, all these types of things, um, the reality was that the implementation had lots of problems. So even though you got a one-year residency permit, in order to renew that, you had to show indications that you were integrating. You had to show that you had a formal job. You had to show that you had a housing contract. You had to show these other types of things. Um, so people, one year is a pretty short timeline to expect that from people. So many people were then going to go back into a regular status, and it wasn't sort of enough from the state to really make sure that people not only had access to the status, but that you know, reciprocally that Moroccan nationals were being sensitized to the presence of migrants and were willing to hire someone with this, this new status or were willing to offer a housing contract, et cetera. Um, so there were issues around that, even though the state was making, you know, a, a quite sort of making a lot of fanfare around this and, you know, bragging about it diplomatically. Um, but in reality on the ground, a lot of the civil society organizations and um, NGOs that were working with migrants, refugees and, and migrant leaders themselves had a lot of complaints about how that was being implemented. Um, the pathway to citizenship is difficult. I, you know, I think Turkey is a really interesting example in that regard because historically it has actually offered um, when there were Afghan refugees um, in previous decades, it offered citizenship to sort of a select few of um, uh, of, uh, of these refugee of this refugee population um, because you know they they had gotten very good at sort of establishing relationships with the government and the government saw them as future voters. So it was willing to offer that citizenship. And then we see that repeated under Erdogan with, um, with some Syrian nationals as well. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, I don't wanna say never, but 
for the most part, the offer of citizenship is, is generally not on the table. But, um, you know, citizenship aside, that's sort of a big ask. I think there are ways to offer, um, there, there are ways to do sort of what Morocco was trying to do, but maybe find ways to make sure that people have access to longer term residency or um, making sure that there are integration measures that accompany that, uh, not just sort of, you know, not just um, doing it for this show or for this diplomatic reasons, but to make sure that it's really working on the ground. Um, and then the second question was, can you remind me, Dina? Uh, the second question is whether there have been attempts at creating semi-autonomous entities. Uh, so uh, by that, do they mean like organizations run by migrants and, and refugees themselves? Or possibly by the, by, by the state itself. Have they, have they formed kind of, uh, or have they allowed uh, the the uh, refugees and migrants to set up semi-autonomous entities uh, like organ like the companies is that maybe I'm not sure I'm not sure if I quite understand the the uh, question but I'll, I'll just answer so you know like in Egypt for example um, there's been quite a lot of promotion actually recently and I don't I don't think I talked about it as much in the book because I when I was doing research there later in 2019 I was hearing more about it um, but there were there was certainly a lot of um, promotion by the government and you know allowing for Syrian nationals to come in and form companies and business entities because it saw Syrians as being a, you know investment in that uh, that practice to be quite lucrative for the state and for um, for for the, the Syrian communities as well. Um, so a lot so some you know industrial or, or uh, companies or um, Restaurants, for example, were allowed to sort of move their operations from Syria to to Egypt. Um, so the state was quite, you know, promotional of that. So I think it depends on the group, and I think it depends on what the state sees as sees how how it sees itself benefiting from that type of um, that type of ability. Um, in terms of, I just want to say though, maybe this is also what you mean, but maybe not. I think there have been a lot of. Um, community-based organizations that in all three countries that you see um, being formed by migrants and refugees themselves, not not, not commercial businesses, but, you know, um, sort of civil society actors. Many of them are informal. They're not registered with the state, but they do, you know, provide sort of a sense of community for migrants and refugees, um, co-nationals, but also sometimes we see organizations that are, um, you know, embracing of all migrants and refugees. Um, certainly saw that in Morocco and in Turkey um, and somewhat in Egypt as well. And these organizations are really lifelines for a lot of a lot of migrants and refugees who don't other who wouldn't otherwise have much of a community space. And sometimes they're overtly political, but oftentimes are more sort of just focused on providing you know social space, um, a a place for people to maybe get some kind of training or just to you know establish relationships with other co-nationals. Um, so those those play quite an important role in all three of the empirical chapters that I look at, or all, all three of the cases. Okay, thank you. Uh, so there's a question about Egypt in particular, and thinking and, and asking what now that you have a different leadership in the country, and uh, that it has stabilized, quote unquote. I think um, is is the strategy that they are employing a bit opportunistic in the fact that they are welcoming maybe entrepreneurs from Syria. Uh, Yemen, Libya, etc., to create change, mm -hmm. build in the country, um, and then there's another related question, which is uh, about the relationist approach um, and the fact that if we think, about, can we think about the migration crisis as requiring the co cooperation between Middle Eastern countries and European ones? So, in a sense, uh, did you see a sense of, um, uh, did you find from your uh, from your research? That there was, in terms of state policies, was there um, reliance on maybe or, or trying to draw on European policies towards migrants, etc. Okay, um, let me take the first one and then I'll, I'll loop back for the second. Um, so, in regards to Egypt, yeah, it's a it's a great question that you ask. It's I think it's very interesting to see how Egypt's policy is shifting a bit now. So, I mean, again, just in terms of the timeline, I think I didn't have you know I, I talk about this earlier period. Uh, 2013, 2014, maybe even into 2015, when Egypt was still acting fairly repressively towards migrants and refugees, beginning with Syrians, but also other nationalities, um, Ethiopians, um, Eritreans, others in the country, Sudanese. So um, I think you're right. I think more in more recent years, Egypt, I think maybe from about 17, to, sorry, 2017 onward, and even more so when I was there in 2019, it was becoming quite clear that Egypt was sort of learning how to play this, this new game um, of 
you know, appealing to Europe for all sorts of funding to, you know, to host its migrants, uh, migrant refugee populations or to welcome um, or to be more receptive to other populations coming. Um, as you said, Yemenis, uh, Libyans, other other groups. So I think that Egypt is. Um, I don't. I don't think it's actually changing entire is so much on the ground. But I do think that there's a lot. There's a much more different dialogue now um, being utilized by the FCC regime. And I mean, again, so under 2014, when this repressive policy was happening, it wasn't a different leadership at the time. It was, you know, the, well, I guess it was military leadership. But then he was elected in 2014. So it's, you know, it's a change within the same administration. But I think they're just the incentives are different now. It knows that by claiming it's going to offer a more liberal policy towards migrants and refugees, um, it sees that it can benefit from that in regards to its relationship with Europe. So, you know, it, it's offered previously only certain nationalities could attend Egyptian public schools. And now it's said that all nationalities of refugees and asylum seekers can access Egyptian public schools. There's talk about possibly implementing a domestic asylum policy, which Egypt hasn't had. So, you know, it, it's making these sort of moves that you, that you see in other states in the Mediterranean um, that I think are signaling to Europe that it's it's willing to sort of get on board with with um, some of Europe's preferences. So I think I think you're right. I think there's interesting um, movements happening. Um, sorry, Dina, can you remind me of the second question, though? I'm, I'm, I'm going back up to it. Um, so the other one is about the application of the so-called relationistic approach towards migration crisis since it requires the cooperation of both Middle Eastern countries and European ones. So I don't know whether this is a question or whether, whether this is a statement, mm -hmm. um, but did you see in your research a, co you know, a cooperation in terms of policy, state policies towards refugees? Sure, yeah, I mean, all, all three of the countries I'm looking at and really, I mean, name any country in, in the Mediterranean region and they have some kind of migration uh, agreement with Europe, right? I think it's interesting in, in Turkey and in, in the Turkish and Moroccan cases that definitely that relationship was more important to those actors um, during the time period that I'm looking at. Um, and, you know, Morocco had had, a, had had various agreements with Europe um, for years and around 2013, right around that time of that policy change, it also agreed to a new migration agreement with Europe that I think was important in, in uh, deciding to implement that change in 2013. Uh, Turkey, of course, also has had many agreements with Europe, um, you know, as part of its larger accession process beginning in the 2000s, it's, it's migration has been one of the most important topics um, in thinking about if Turkey were to join the European Union, what kind of changes would have to happen in Turkey in regards to migration and asylum? So that was really sort of one of the, you know, an impetus for Turkey thinking about reforming its policy. Although I talk in the book about how it, you know, I think people might sort of uh, too simplistically think that, oh, well, uh, the EU was requiring Turkey to change its policy. So that's what Turkey did. But actually the, the accession negotiations had fallen apart uh, before Turkey decided to go ahead and adopt this new policy. And I think it was more about Turkey perceiving that there would be benefits for the state from doing that as opposed to, you know, Europe demanding it of, of Turkey. Um, so I, again, it's, you know, comes back to the state being um, the Middle East North African states as being strategic actors in their own right and not just responding only to the, the demands of, of Europe. And so I think that, you know, and I think this book is in line with other, other work out there now that's, you know, rethinking, well, what is the viewpoint from south of the Mediterranean, not from, from Europe in regards to how these relationships are established and, and what the incentives are. Okay, thank you. There's a question from Bruce Stan Stanley with your in emphasis on urban spaces. Did you ident identify differences in application of indifference among different cities, either within a country or across your three cases? And was securitization, policing and carceral mechan uh, mechanisms differed, for example, uh, among cities. And that relates to an earlier question about, you know, the camps as a site for, you know, kind of uh, refugees and migration and, you know, whether you, you know, you kind of by focusing on urban spaces, you, you, you know, kind of neglect the camps. This mm -hmm. is my understanding of the question. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think uh, in regards to different practices in different parts of, of countries or different locations, I think Morocco is a great example. Um, so even in this earlier period that I'm speaking about, um, when I, I'm calling the Moroccan policy one of indifference, there were, I would say, more repressive policies towards migrants and refugees residing close to the Spanish border, towards the, the enclaves of, of Ceuta and, and Melilla. Um, 
on the northern coast of Morocco because Spain had put a lot of pressure on Morocco to, you know, and, and from the Spanish side as well, there was a lot of active policing happening along those, um, along those very small uh, borders with, with Spain, thus with the EU. So I think that even though there was a policy of indifference towards migrants and refugees residing in more urban spaces in cities like Rabat, Casablanca, et cetera, um, there was a, there was a very active police presence and you know willingness to like demolish camps or deport people um, if they got really close to those Spanish borders. So you're right that even within you know one country, there's of course uh, differences in terms of where people um, are residing and, and what the the preferences are there. Um, and then a question earlier about whether I'm, I'm neglecting camps. Um, I think, well, you know, it's true in the, in the Turkish case, for example, I, I wasn't able to, to go to the camps um, in Turkey's southeast. Uh, at the time, at least I was interviewing um, that was sort of restricted, uh, highly restricted to, to researchers. But um, even then, it's, you know, it's, it's really quite a small proportion of, of refugees that do end up in those camps, the vast majority in Turkey. I mean, this is changing year by year, it was more and more people were residing outside. And when you look at it uh, in terms of a percentage, more and more people were residing in urban spaces. And now it's you know less than 10% that would be in, in Turkish refugee camps. So I think they are important spaces, um, but I was, I was more interested in how this policy works um, in, in urban environments, because I think that is sort of a necessity for this policy of indifference. So I think Turkish policy towards individuals in the camps which you know, it, it wasn't. It, it was a, an arm of the Turkish government that was managing the camps and managing them quite forcefully. From what I understand, um, in the early days, international organizations sort of weren't even allowed into those camps um, because the Turkish government was very insistent about managing them on its own, and eventually uh, relinquished that and allowed international organizations to operate there. But um, yeah, I think that the, the 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 policies that I'm most interested in are these that can operate um, because of. Uh, the ability for migrants and refugees to, you know, integrate to to an extent. Obviously, not fully integrate in the way that we talk about it in the context of the global north, but to participate nonetheless. And I think it's it is difficult for people to do that in camps because most of the time it's you know they're very much not allowed to leave those camps and not allowed to, to interact with host country nationals or host country authorities outside of the camps. Thank you. By the way, you've got so many responses saying a fantastic and brilliant uh, presentation. So oh, that's really nice. I mentioned it now. So that uh, but there's a question about uh, your responsibility uh, uh, to your inter interlocutors uh, mm -hmm. uh, resist residing in these uh, precarious conditions. So in a sense, the, the question is, what, what you know, uh, it, it, is the book an intervention uh, or do you see it as an intervention? Um, and then a, a, another question, because uh, they're both quite short ones is uh, the differentiations between migrants and refugees, because these are different sociological, juridical um, uh, categories. Is there any difference in the way the countries you studied treat them? That is another question. Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, both great questions. So uh, in terms of my responsibilities, um, I mean, this is, you know, it's, it's an excellent question. I think that we, we do have a great responsibility to those who are willing to give us our time. You know, I wasn't offering uh, financial incentives or any other kind of incentives that people are so willing to, to share their stories with me. And so I'm extremely grateful. And, you know, I want this to be, I think there's such a danger to, to fall into um, a situation where you're being extractive as a researcher. And I really tried to be conscious of that and to think about any ways that I could effectively, you know, um, make, make a difference if someone, if some, if I was able to offer something that uh, people, uh, that, that I could offer. I mean, you know, sometimes people, even though it's very clear um, about the fact that this is just a research project and I don't work for, you know, the UN or I don't work for an international organization that can provide direct assistance or could help them with their legal case, et cetera. Um, people still see me as, you know, a white American woman who, maybe could do something for them or for their case. And so that um, always made me feel uncomfortable, but I tried to be as forthright as possible and also gave them my contact information, tried to stay in touch with as many people as possible um, beyond the research project, especially, and this was you know at a time when things were becoming quite tumultuous in, in, in terms of this, this topic. So actually a number of, you know, I talk about how people don't leave and we need to focus on people that are remaining in these countries, but a number of people I spoke with did leave and ended up in countries in Europe, or I know a number of people who got resettled to the US. 
Um, and for those people that I, that I kept in touch with, you know, I was able to at least connect them with other people once they arrived in a new destination um, or, you know, was able to write reference letters for some people who I kept in close contact with. So I think you can at least try to, you know, maintain um, your integrity as a researcher by offering what you can, even though, you know, we, we, even though I can't as, a, as someone who doesn't have a lot of power or authority um, who can't necessarily give, give people the help that they would like to have. Um, or, you know, offering resources as I was learning about these contexts and learning about different organizations that were operating on the ground, at least being able to provide the names of those organizations if people didn't already know about them, pointing them to different directions or different resources. Um, so that's a really good question. That's not a very thorough answer, but something I'm happy to talk more about if um, you want to email me. Um, and then uh, the second question was about, um, I'm so sorry between migrant and refugees. Oh, right. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I have a, you know, a section in the, the introduction of the book where I talk about these labels. And for me, it was important um, to include all these categories. Um, you know, I asked people about their, their legal status if they were willing to share, but it became clear that people, and, you know, as the literature talks about people transition between categories, they might move from, you know, they might arrive in a state and be just a migrant and then learn about the UNHCR and then a few years later become a, an asylum seeker and then a few years after that become a refugee um, and then you know or they might then decide to leave that state and travel somewhere else and become a migrant again so these categories are often fluid and what became clear also was that in in the context in which I was um, speaking with people the the sometimes their legal category really didn't matter in terms of the kind of things that they were able to do or how are they how they were able to get by a lot of times Asylum seekers or refugees were living just like irregular migrants. Um, so for me, it was important to include all the categories. But you are right that there are important distinctions, both I think in terms of how the host state considers its, its legal obligations. Sometimes, sometimes it doesn't actually matter in practice, I would say. Um, but also in terms of how international organizations consider them. So the UNHCR is such a dominant player in all of these countries. And someone who has refugee or asylum seeker status um, is is able to offer certain or is able to access certain services that are funded by the UNHCR, usually via like an intermediary organization um, that others without that status are not able to. But you know, it was important to me to still, even though someone might be, they might be, you know, a, a closed file. So there's someone that they think they should qualify for asylum or refugee status, but they didn't for whatever reason, and they don't want to go back home because it's not considered safe or it's not practical. So they're continuing to exist in the country, um, and just because they can't offer or they can't access these services doesn't mean that you know they aren't trying to sort of find, utilize the same strategies um, as, as someone who does have that status um, in order to get by. So for me, it was important to look at all the categories. Okay, thank you. Um, and so there's a question about the indifference uh, policy. Um, and if you if uh, any of these states put it in place, does that uh, is it viable if it endangers engenders? Um, I think endangers human uh, or engenders, yeah, creates human rights by violation. Um, and uh, in relation, so maybe you could comment on that. Um, but also, there is a, a brilliant question here which says regarding the three types of policy identified liberal, repressive, and indifferent, how far would you say that the, min the states that you uh, researched blend these strategically? rather than confining themselves to one or the other of these mm -hmm. policies. Okay, um, I guess, so the first question, um, which was, uh, does it endanger, you said, um, human yeah. rights protections? Um, human rights violations. Um, yes, I mean, I would, I would uh, argue yes, but um, nonetheless, I think it's, you know, in terms of, how those international, how those violations might be perceived internationally, it still looks, I think they're, they're basically, they're not following, you know, these three countries have signed on to the 1951 Refugee Convention and 67 Protocol in some sense, although Turkey holds geographic uh, limitations to, to that, that convention. Nonetheless, they do have these commitments, these normative commitments to, to protect my, uh, refugees and asylum seekers on their territory, and yet we see many violations, right? So in all three cases, you can pinpoint um, violations of what, what a state should be committed to doing. Um, that said, I think that, you know, a policy of indifference, you know, re relatively hands off and, and sort of 
characterized by a lack of direct intervention looks a lot better than a repressive policy, whereby you know states are actively trying to remove people from its system, often very violently through policing and then detention or deportation. Um, so I think that whilst it you know it doesn't look great, and I think the international community, predominantly global north states, would like to see a state implement a more liberal policy because not not because they care so much about human rights, but because that in theory would mean that people would stay there longer or they wouldn't feel the need to travel onward to the global to the global north. Um, I think that, you know, in comparison to a repressive policy and indifferent policy still looks pretty good or is perceived positively internationally. Um, and then the next question is what, so states, do they kind of blend policies? Yeah, I think that's that's an interesting way to put it. I guess I think about more what, you know, what I'm talking about in the book is what's the sort of predominant policy at any given time. Um, so as I said, in response to an earlier question, you know, looking at Morocco um, in that earlier period that I'm calling where, I, where I'm saying it had a predominantly indifferent policy, um, that doesn't mean that there weren't sort of elements of, of a repressive policy occurring, you know, as I said, especially in um, the north of the country where people were living close to the Spanish border. So I think that there, you know, there can be an element of that at the time, but predominantly I would characterize the response at that point as, as one of indifference. Um, and again, I think people, I think states can kind of shift between these given the incentives in place at the time. So Egypt, as we talked about, um, is one from what I would say is a more different policy to more repressive policy. And then I would say probably slid kind of back to indifference and now is maybe showing signs that it's interested in implementing a liberal policy. Although again, I think it would be more of a de jure liberal policy rather than real change on the ground that would you know, characterize integration. Brilliant. Um, so in relation to the indifference policy, there's a question saying whether, you, whether by pursuing the indifference policy um, and allowing migrants to pursue informal work or go to school, etc. Does that contribute to keeping them in a, you know, a protracted situation uh, that is more difficult to, to manage in the long run? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so how, how you know, what, what do you think about that question or did you not look into it? Uh, so, so you're saying because um because states are offering some uh, sense of, even though it's informal integration, does that allow them to sort of continue to be there for a long term as opposed to necessitating that they either go back home or move onward, right? I mean, yeah, it's an interesting question. I think it brings up, you know, in, in the refugee and migration studies literature and in the policy world, they talk about three options that states have, right, um, to, to respond to um, refugees specifically. So they can or sorry, they, they, not how states respond, but three options that refugees themselves have. So they can be resettled to a third country, they can locally integrate, or they can return back home. Those are sort of the three ways that refugees can manage or that people can uh, sort of enforce that refugees manage. Um, so I think that in, in the book, I talk a bit about how um, resettlement, as we know, is such a such an is, op, is an option for so few people. So less than one percent of the world's refugees actually get resettled to a third country. So that's kind of it's on the table, but it's kind of barely on the table, especially with the past four years of policy in the United States, which was the largest resettlement country for many years, right? Um, so returning home is not always an option because people uh, can't, it, you know, they have no control over what the situation in their home country is like. And if it's a protracted, uh, protracted civil war or generalized violence or other situations where they might not feel comfortable returning home. Um, so the option on the table is this sort of de facto local integration that, you know, it's been, it's been an option for a long time. I think historically it was actually more of an option and, and it wasn't so politicized or it wasn't so, um, so off the table for states. I think now it's really difficult to talk about local integration, even with states that I think would, to some extent, acknowledge that that local integration is occurring. You know, I talked with um, elite actors in Egypt, for example, in the Egyptian government that handles um, that is responsible for migrants and refugees, um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they they know that local integration is occurring. They know people are participating in the informal economy, but they don't want that to become um, they don't want it to become forthright policy or you know written policy. They, they acknowledge that it's happening. They acknowledge that there are all these uh, organizations like UNHCR and other civil society actors that are kind of managing it on the state's behalf. But whether they want to really promote 
um, integration is, is another matter entirely. Um, so I, I don't see it as um, so much promoting protracted situations. I think it's sort of the only option left if people can't necessarily re return home and if people can't travel onward. I think it would be better if states were more forthright and, and willing to acknowledge that it's happening and maybe if not encourage it, at least allow it to happen in a more formal sense as opposed to, as opposed to it having to be sort of this under the table matter. Mm, thank you. Um, so there's a question related to your chapter on ethnicity and uh, or religion and whether uh, whether uh, the question is does the state privilege refugees in line with their ethnicity or religion while offering services and treatment in particular in the case of Turkey uh, does Turkey make a distinction between refugees uh, such as the Kurds and the Yazidis or the Arabs um, so whether you could respond to that yeah I'll, I'll say that um the short answer is yes. <laughs> I think there are, you know, variations to policies that, that do occur according to someone's um, ethnicity or, you know, state sort of ex uh, express preference for certain groups of, of refugees that arrive. Um, I talk a, a bit briefly about it in, in Turkey um, and how, you know, we saw a very different treatment from, from the government towards Kurdish uh, refugees coming from Syria uh, versus um, other, like, uh, other groups that arrived. Um, the, at one point in 2014, the government was very reluctant to sort of allow in um, these groups from from the Kurdistan region in Syria because of you know it what it perceived as that possibly igniting uh, tensions with the Kurdish groups in Turkey. So yeah, of, of course there are preferences and hesitancies on the part of the government towards um, different groups. In the book, I, I focus more actually on, on Morocco and Egypt um, because that was where I did more migrant and refugee interviews or sort of the same number of migrant and refugee interviews. And I also, this is getting a bit into the weeds, but I talk a bit about how um, there's this, you know, assumption um, and we help create it, I think in academia too, about this dividing line of the Sahara. So, you know, people from Sub-Saharan Africa versus North Africa. And I look in, in the case of these two receiving countries, Egypt and Morocco, about whether um, those perceived as coming from Sub-Saharan Africa are treated differentially from other, you know, quote unquote, Arab uh, migrants and refugees coming from other parts of, you know, coming from Syria, for example. Um, or even in the case of Morocco, although it may be considered West Africa, a, pr a preferential group would be um, Senegalese because of, uh, his, history and sort of ties and religious ties um, between Senegal and Morocco. Um, so that group is given sort of preferential treatment. But I do give, but I do, I do differentiate in this chapter as well between de facto treatment and de jure treatment. So in the case of de jure treatment, this would be, you know, again, with this example of Senegalese and Morocco, um, Senegalese are able to come to Morocco and not have to apply for a carte de séjour, like a, um, a residency permit. Um, in order to find work in Morocco. So that's sort of a leg up that they have over other individuals coming from West Africa. Um, and, you know, you talk with lots of uh, people coming from um, Nigeria, for example, or other parts of West Africa who see Senegalese as sort of the, the preferred group. Um, but that doesn't mean that Senegalese themselves see, <laughs> see themselves as pre preferred group in, in contrast to maybe Syrians, for example. So it's, it's very relational. Um, and I try to break apart all these different, you know, assumptions about religion and race and ethnicity um, in this chapter. And it's a complex issue, so I'm not probably going to do it justice here. But, um, but I, I do, again, look at de jure versus de facto treatment of individuals as well as looking at it, you know, individual responses, you know, how they feel themselves being uh, treated versus in the aggregate picture, um, looking at all these responses together and whether whether that that divide with the Sahara, so whether you're sub-Saharan African or, or coming from other um, parts of North Africa or uh, the Middle East, whether that then factors into how people are treated or their perceptions of how they're treated. So it's a bit convoluted. I know your question was mostly about Turkey. Um, but I would love if you do read the book and read the chapter to hear um, your feedback, whoever asked that question. Thank you. And specifically about Morocco, there's, there's a question that is related to this, which is, um, you know, you, you mentioned Senegalese, but uh, can you elaborate on the treatment of migrants based on ethnicity, race, and religion in the context of Morocco's own racial and ethnic demographic mix? Islam as a state, its history as anti-Black racism toward mm -hmm. Black Moroccans. And, uh, and in the same question, what impact has Morocco's 2011 constitution had uh, on its policies towards 
migrants and refugees. So I don't know whether you covered that in, in your work. Um, so I do talk a little bit about like the history as they were alluding to um, in terms of uh, history of slavery and sort of lasting effects of that in Morocco um, and perceptions of race uh, that that are you know um, that are influenced by by this history as well as you know history of coloniality and um, the lasting impact that that has had. So. Um, and, and in terms of the 2011 constitution, I don't think I talk about how um, that might impact this migration policy reform or perceptions of migrants and refugees themselves. But I would like I would like to hear more if, if um, it sounds like this uh, respondent is quite knowledgeable about the topic. So I'd like to hear um, their opinions if possible too, if you want to email me. Um, but yeah, I'll just say that, you know, I, I talk about sort of the broad context of, um, of migration and perceptions of migration in uh, in Morocco, and I think in regards to your, your first question about media, I talk a bit about, you know, how the media has covered race and migration and a lot of linkages that are made um, between, uh, you know, and, and also the influence of um, Spanish attitudes or Spanish policy towards migrants, uh, which I think also impacts then how Morocco also feels about its new role as a host state. Um, and I think that, you um, for migrants and refugees themselves, certainly they feel the implications of, of these racial attitudes. And I think especially for those from certain West African countries, um, they in particular feel out, as outsiders in Morocco. And that seems that that will be a lasting issue, even if we see sort of stronger moves towards protection or you know longer residency permits or longer uh, or more, more robust um, means by which people might sort of stay legally in Morocco and build a life, I think that the, the issue of race and the issue of xenophobia will be a, a major um, uh, battleground. And I know that there are organizations working on this, trying to promote um, tolerance and you know, accepting of, of the presence of migrants um, amongst Moroccans. Um, there's, you know, a lot of NGOs, I think, have taken up this, this cause, uh, human rights focused NGOs that didn't necessarily work on migration before, but they've partnered with um, uh, community based organizations, uh, migrant community based organizations to try and address this issue. So I think it's, you know, it's an ongoing, um, an ongoing battle, but I think that it needs to be like a dual approach of both the government leading the way with policies that make it possible for people to stay, uh, stay legally in Morocco, combined with this sort of sensitization um, for the Moroccan population. Okay, I'm going to put two last questions together because we don't have time. And uh, there's a one question, another question that is left unanswered, but maybe you could post the question to Kelsey. Uh, the contact information is in the chat. Uh, so the question is, are there cases where liberal approach has changed, you know, regularized employment livelihood opportunities? And in relation to this, um, in terms of Turkey's migration policy changing from indifferent to liberal engagement mm -hmm. after 2013 to 2014, could you give some examples of what type of policy changes occurred in the state level that aimed to bring migrants and refugees into the national system? Mm -hmm. So. Um, the two questions are very similar. So in a sense, uh, the liberal approach does it, uh, and what concrete policies does a liberal approach uh, bring uh, mm -hmm. or uh, bring forward on the table? Thank mm -hmm. you. Sure, um, those are great questions. Uh, I think, so in terms of what we could draw on from positive examples, I think there's, there's lots and I think it, you know, it's not a one size fits all solution. So I think what could work uh, more positively in Morocco um, might not be applicable in Turkey and vice versa. But, you know, there are really great examples of, of regularization campaigns working. So it's not not to critique Morocco for attempting that. But I think that there were ways that it could have followed through on the regularization. And as I said, in the regards to the previous question, in conjunction with other practices that would have made it more possible for people to have an easier time uh, remaining in Morocco and participating formally. Um, so regularization campaigns can can work. I think it's just um, it has to be uh, quite carefully done. Um, I, I think that you know in terms of other so when we think about sort of what is a liberal policy. You know I mentioned earlier in the talk that encompasses things like making sure that that kids are able to access schools. Um, but it, you know in, in addition to making sure that um, that that they are really able to access schools. So I know in Egypt, for example, certain nationalities are able to access schools, but in reality, they face all sorts of barriers, whether it's language barriers or 
Um, you know, even if even if they're an Arabic speaker, they might not speak the Egyptian dialect, and that's a problem. So they'd rather go to like an NGO run school or some sort of community school. So finding ways to integrate models so that people can um, send their, their kids to school and have them actually make sure that they're learning. Um, as well as, you know, finding employment opportunities. And I think that, you know, I, I talk a bit in the book and I don't want to go too far off topic here, but about, you know, the, the push, for example, in the, the Jordan model um, to have, um, uh, what, what am I trying to say? The economic model whereby Jordan companies, if they're willing to hire Syrian refugees, for example, they would receive all sorts of, of benefits for that, right? But the way that that was implemented um, was critiqued by, by people who know this context because it wasn't um, done in consultation with refugees themselves about what, what their needs were and how could they actually travel to these special zones where they would be working formally for companies, um, you know, whether there was childcare provided, if women were going to be working in garment factories, etc. So I think whatever the, the attempt to allow for formal employment needs to be done in consultation with those who will be most impacted. And so that's I think that's um, that's key um, in terms of other, you know, we, and we can think about other, whether it's schooling, um, access to housing, access to formal work, um, access to other types of services, healthcare, for example, um, all of these things, I think in a liberal model would be done like pretty efficiently by the state. And I think that we're just not quite seeing that in any of the countries that or the two countries I talked about that, that tried to implement a more, a more um, liberal model. In, in terms of the, Second question, which if I'm remembering now was about, oh, in Turkey, what did we really see? So we saw this huge overhaul of a, of a framework um, whereby, you know, I, people described it to me as Turkey finally moving away from like a more security oriented approach to migration and asylum towards a more um, human rights based approach. Um, and that was supposed to mean, you know, the end of um, all sorts of problems in these in Turkish detention centers. Um, less less policing and more, you know, uh, allowing people, as I as we talked about with what a liberal model is, allowing um, and ensuring that people have access to things like health services or education. Um, and in Turkey, you know, even with with Syrian nationals, uh, that was supposed to also mean um, allowing them to access formal work. But again, this hasn't really panned out in the way that was promised um, with with all that European funding that was coming in. So I think that there are ways to improve that in Turkey. I just don't know. I don't know how much the incentive is there at the moment um, to really ensure that, that that policy on the ground is robust for refugees. And I don't think that um, I don't think that there were enough sort of there was enough conditionality and enough um, insurance on the part of, of Europe, which was offering a lot of the funding, which was supposed to make the situation better, at least for Syrian nationals as part of the EU Turkey deal. Um, I don't think that there's been enough um, monitoring or ensuring that that's really going to, to take shape on the ground. That's fantastic. That's a, a very good end to a brilliant discussion. I had loads of people saying fantastic discussion. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank you for, you know, just, uh, info, you know, in, informative, very informative and uh, interesting to look at it comparatively and, and, and thinking about state, uh, state governance in terms of uh, refugees. Uh, so thanks for that. And thanks for all the good questions, everyone. Um, and um, look forward to reading the book. I haven't read it yet, but now I feel I have to. <laughs> <laughs> so please remember that the book is, is in the chat, so you could go and, uh, and uh, kind of uh, order it. And we're looking forward to seeing you again, Kelsey. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you so much for having me. Take care, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>